I think my eye got a little bit scratched when I was uh, taking up my contact wasn't fitting right. I took it out, put it back in. I think I scratched it when I took it out. All right. Turn it over. Look right here, everyone. Look at this side here. So, a couple things in really quick. Are we having trouble here? Are we? Did I give you a bunch extra? What's the deal? Here? All right. So, when I was talking to somebody, got access to somebody talking from the college board, talking about what we need another one. Pass one back. I gave like three extra here, not enough here. And so, talking to someone with the college board, talking about uh, the DVQ and the changes they made this end of September into October, which uh, I had a couple assumptions about it from the way I read it, but I think uh, there's a few differences and a few things I do want to emphasize a little bit differently than I originally did. So I quick type this up from our conversation. By the way, if you notice any blaring uh, typos, please let me know because I typed it very fast. I read, I knew what I was thinking, but sometimes maybe when I proofread, I think we all have this problem. We see what we think we meant to write sometimes. So we're looking at this side right here. And so the things they emphasize, first I've made a little practice outline, but look right here. And it has you know, thesis statement and you know what I call the why, the purpose. They're really emphasizing the term. And I don't think this is about it. It's claims. This is your claim, is your why. The claim for what you're going to, um, what position you're going to take. You're going to have to basically uh, support your claim in your thesis. And so that's, I thought that was a good way to put for the why. So I, I like that part. And then the same deal with subtopics A, B, and C, or A and B, depending on if it's a five or four paragraph essay. But like each topic then is that's how you're going to um, prove or support your claim. Context. They really are going to emphasize context more, I would just hold. And so context, what I really emphasized in the past, we said this in that first paragraph, have background, the events that led up to it. So if you're going to write an essay on, on the ratification battle, geez, that might be a good topic, you would talk about in context about like the actual Treaty of Versailles, what's in it, the end of the war. That would be context. But they also want additional context at the end. And so I put this down in the closing paragraph. They want broad context, AKA what it led to. And so, for example, we did that DBQ or, you know, on the, on the, on the um, what caused the civil war, what caused the session. And so what it led to, a horrible civil war that the North would win but would dramatically change the country. 
with the 13th Amendment and Reconstruction, something like that. You know, what it led to. They're really, they really are going to emphasize that. No, that was nowhere in the original document I was given to. So I'm glad I, I talked to them. So opening paragraph, context, what led to it. Closing paragraph, the effect. Thesis, okay, we've talked about thesis before. That hasn't changed. Uh, body paragraph. So body paragraphs have three elements, and I'm giving you some of their terms. The evidence from the documents or the documents. And one other thing they're going to really emphasize with documents that they have not in the past, a little bit more about the purpose of the document, what the document is trying to say. You're not going to copy the document. You're not just summarizing it, but a little bit more. And so it used to be like one basic sentence showing how the document supports your thesis. It's now one or two sentences. They want a little bit more on the document. And that means you've got to relate it to what you know, put it in context for the situation. So if you look down, I have evidence for the documents, and I'll explain four to seven in just a second. I put body paragraphs, documented, I kind of rather more information about it. And then half. Remember half. Historical content, audience, purpose, point of view. Basically, why that author or that article why it believes what it does, what about their point of view, what about their purpose. And he made it sound like they want that for every dollar. And so, to get full credit in this year's DBQ, it was either to use four documents, each with half, or connect seven documents to your thesis. The way he made it sound like to me is they really would like you to do four. Use four documents and for each one, give that extended analysis, we call it, AKA half. Everyone hear what I said? They're really emphasizing that. I'm really glad I talked to them. You're going to do seven with half? Yeah. They won't or just say it too much. No, they would never do that. Okay, so for years they called it outside information. They've added a new acronym. He kept saying, and don't forget, we need evidence beyond the documents. A lot of EBDs. EBD, got to do EBD. What? What are you talking about? But that's outside information. Evidence beyond the documents. They want that one per, per paragraph. You spoke, it says, you know, one per paragraph. So one more additional thing outside the documents to connect with this. I, I was for years, you know, I've been doing this teaching AP US history for, for almost 25 years, and it was always outside information. Now they have a new acronym, evidence beyond the documents. And then another document, and then the last one, if you look at the body paragraph, complex understand. That's what they're calling the, remember when it's told you about the importance, that last <coughs> one is kind of tied all together, shows it's important to relate to the thesis. So that's what they're looking for for the paragraphs. So this is what we're going to do on Wednesday. I'm going to give you the documents small, that's my plan, and you're going to go through them. I'll give you one day, and you'll come back. And for this essay tomorrow, you're writing a four-paragraph essay, and you're going to have two documents and two examples in half in each body paragraph. You hear what I said? Then each paragraph must have EBD, outside information, and some kind of they showing the importance of it related to your thesis, which they call complex understanding. Hmm? Per document. I mean, per, per paragraph. Per paragraph. Two sources per paragraph. And they also really want you to do, like in the document, is to say, Wood, document uh, six is from Woodrow Wilson. You say, Woodrow Wilson believed this. Everyone hear what I said? Or if it's Herbert Hoover, Herbert Hoover believed this. Or the political cartoon from the Pittsburgh Times said this. Yes. No, no, I'm giving you additional documents. So the read I gave you was just background information. So two documents provided. So four. Yeah. Yeah. 
I, and I believe that one has John, a choice of seven. <laughs> Choose four. Two, 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 two. Yeah, two outside information officers. Oh, six total. Huh? Six total. Yeah, six total bits of evidence. Yeah. Yeah, chapter seven. Do we make an outline like usual? You got to make an outline. I think Okay, so on the back, I gave you a practice outline. But to fit in the information, you know, you, I, I've used columns just to kind of get everything in there for the three, so you can see it have plenty of room. But so you have to have just a couple, one or two words of that basic out. And so I will let you have this out when you draw it or when you write your DVD. Wow. What? I'm just happy to be able Yeah, you get that too. Yeah, you can look at that. Yeah. One or two sentences. One or two sentences. Now, I think this is both good and bad. I don't like the fact that it's almost too mechanical in a way, but it, then again, in a time to essay, it's not so exactly. So I don't think it's. I don't think it's the best way to write an essay, but it's also if you have to do certain things to pass it, you know, it's good to know. So we just. And that's where we have. Now, last thing, you'll notice I have a third paragraph on here, optional body paragraph. So on your AP exam, let's say you're actually taking the test and you have, you have a little bit more time than you would in a class period. And you need four documents, right? Wouldn't it be good to have one additional document and a half to hedge your bets? See what I mean by that? Just in case you don't get the point for all four, you have one additional one, so it'll give you another point. And so you can add three documents, use three documents to one of your body paragraph without it, which is huge. And so a good way to hedge your bets is to do a fifth document and a couple additional pieces of outside information in another body paragraph for like your third body paragraph. But we're not going to do that third one on Wednesday just for time reasons. And so Please look at this. If you notice any going your typos, let me know. On this outline, you're going to use this basic information. It's on the ratification of the Treaty of Versailles. It has to be in the end. No, the notes outline does not have to be in Notes outline be in you want, but when, you, when we're writing the exam, it has to be in pen. Oh, your thesis statement, underline it before you put half, put a little star next to the sentence so you know. That's why I put the asterisk there. If there's anything glaringly noticeable that you don't understand, let me know and I can make a change because I know what I was thinking, but I'm tight. I, I did notes and I was writing them up. Yeah, put a star right for the center. And that's something that, that was a suggestion I got this um, just down a few years ago, just the way it's Oh yeah. How do you want to put a star there? If you want to put a little star next to your context, you can do that. All you're doing is just alerting the person bringing this stuff is coming out. You got you got ten seconds. Go. Fifteen. Go. All right. So let's go take your notes out. Does everyone then hold? Please read through this. If you have any questions? Especially if I made a mistake on it, I really want to know, so I can go back and make a change again. Yeah, the mechanical way of doing the essays, I think, are both good and bad. But gotta remind yourself, this is not creative writing. This is a timed essay, so gotta go. Yeah. Oh, that, change change of thing. If since I said chapter twenty three has to be due on Wednesday. Um, I guess let's make it do on Thursday. What? Chapter 23, the review book, I assigned you on, on Wednesday, or for Wednesday, but since we're doing the DBQ. Sound good? Huh? How many? Nine. I have no idea. It's not, the chapters in the review book aren't great. I think it's about 12 pages at the yeah. most. It's, it's really. It's a review book as the basic information. All right, so where do we finish on Friday?
Oh, we got the 14 points. So we got the four, so we talked about suffrage. Oh, who is that person right here? What was her name? Alice Paul. Yeah, Alice Paul. What was the amendment that um, was, it, it was also known as what? Yeah, Susan B. Anthony. What was also a wartime measure, the 18th Amendment? Prohibition. Yeah, prohibition. What was the worldwide pandemic? What an amazing time. I mean, World War I is kind of shocking. We got the 14 points. We got yeah, Alice Paul. We got hunger strikes, bolstered acts. It's all very quick. Does this look right? Yeah, and Central Europe, you have all these people living together. And the thought was, oh, well, just let people decide their fate. Well, what if your population or what if areas have seven or eight different ethnic groups, which is kind of Central Europe? Part of being in a multicultural empire is you get people piled on top of each other. And so this is actually the, you, you do not need this. Or like redrawing the Italian frontier, so vaguely promising Italy something. Restoration of French territory, Alsatian Lorraine. But most of the allies looked at this as if, or as very unrealistic. So while this is going on, the first American forces are arriving. The fall of 1917, the first US forces dumped the American Expeditionary Force arrived. But it's gonna be well into 1918 before there's gonna be large numbers of US troops. They were dubbed Doughboys, and that became the name and for all American soldiers. World War II or World War I started World War II that way, but then the nickname for American soldiers kind of shifted during the middle of World War II to something else. The overall commander was John Pershing. He was the guy who commanded the cavalry in New Mexico during the Mexican Civil War. Anybody know what U.S. soldiers were called in World War II? Yankees. That actually was more World War I, but both. But they kind of vague the games. Well, military is the government. The government issues you clothes. Government issue. GI. That's what GI. Government issue. Yeah. Yeah. GI. Government issue. Government issues are the clothes. All right. So. This is crazy. 1918. The Germans are going to try one last roll of the die with all those troops now fresh from Russia. Hindenburg and Ludendorff planned a new offensive with four large numbers of U.S. troops. Now, they knew the U.S. troops would be green, uh, not very well prepared for the war, but there was going to be a lot of them. And the numbers they knew would eventually overwhelm the Germans. So on the left is Hindenburg, then the Kaiser, then Ludendorff. So last chance before large numbers for, for U.S. numbers. Do you guys know this um, for numbers? The, yeah, I have. You first didn't know it, but okay. I mean, I'm used to it. Yeah. And especially trained Legos were used at the front line. Okay, I, I was looking at, I wanted a picture of stormtroopers and actually there's Lego stormtroopers. Stormtroopers was a specially trained German, also term for shock troops, the first troops to attack. And the Germans, through years of fighting, would use these troops instead of mass wave attacks to infiltrate behind enemy lines. And yes, another example of George Lucas really being influenced by World War I and Star Wars. Here are actual stormtroopers. They carried, sometimes they carried whole satchel bags big bags full of grenades. They had new weapons at short range, but put a lot of bullets out called submachine guns. And the thought was these specially, tro specially trained troops would infiltrate and go past heavily defended areas, get into the enemy rear and wreak havoc, cause panic and just advance. So instead of just trying to charge enemy lines, they would use new tactics with very quick, heavy bombardments and then attack. And the plan was to go against the British. There was always an assumption, just like the submarine warfare, that the British are about ready to drop out. And it kind of worked. They broke the stalemate. They advanced past British lines, overwhelmed the British. And for the first time on the Western Front, 
there was open fight, fighting and open, an open terrain. In fact, in some areas, they advanced 60 miles. This had not happened since 1914. It was shocking. But I think you can see part of the problem that the Germans advanced. Here's the remnants of a British trench line. They thought they'd have cavalry and shoot through the gap. But it was impossible to advance in the wasteland here. And they advanced past their supply lines. The stormtroopers are going to be the first ones that are going to be killed. So their numbers went down. But the big reason that their advance failed and would also begin the end of the German Empire was this. The men had been promised, they had been told that the British were starving because of the, slot, the submarine blockade. All it's going to take is one hard push and the British will collapse. They're out of food, they're walking skeletons. Now we know the blockade had failed, but they had been telling the German soldiers and the civilians at home the sacrifice you're making, the horrible food we now have, no food at home, terrible food at the front, it's worth it. Because we're about ready to win. They're worse off than you. And when they advanced and got to these support, these trenches here, they expected to see starving British soldiers. In fact, they saw more food than they had seen since the beginning of the war. The British had supplies they couldn't even imagine. And all this food because of the blockade had failed. Did everyone hear what they said? What I said, that meant their leaders were doing what to them? Lying. And they caught them in a lie. And not just a minor lie, a massive lie. It didn't look like we're about ready to win. It looked like, looked like the British could fight forever, at least to their point of view. This would sow the seeds for the end of the German Empire. It began to corrode the German army. Discipline began to break down, and men literally sat and gorged themselves on the food they, they, they captured. The, the advance did not go as fast as it could have because the men are like, I got to stop and eat. And why should I trust you? And you know how it is. If you catch one person in a lie, start thinking, what else are they lying about? This would be in the end. They didn't see it right away, but it's going to happen. They're going to do many different offensives in this spring offensive. They will break through the lines, but never totally break through the settlement. And the French and the Allies finally committed on one leader for all the forces. Marshal Ferdinand Foch, right there. He would command all Allied forces on the Western Front. They finally agreed to it. So here are all the Allied commanders, and Foch in front. So, like, for example, the French Marshal Bataan, the British General Haig, there's General Pershing for the Americans. But they accepted one commander. And Foch was a good, hard nosed leader. He was not like a brilliant tactician, but he understood that Germany must be defeated and knew how to win the war. This was a decisive change. So the Germans kept advancing, were totally exhausted, but they would be stopped. Here are French soldiers, now more in open terrain. I know they're hiding in a ruined building, but they were able to stop the Germans who just, their offensive ran out of steam and didn't end the war. And I know what a lot of you are thinking. That Foch seems like a good guy. I want to memorialize him. You too can have this tattoo that she got. This French woman two years ago was showing off her tattoo of Marshal Foch. Isn't that awesome? I bet that'd be a really easy and basically painless tattoo to get. Just imagine seeing that like in a swimming pool. Moving on. So they actually advanced. This is the, the first offensive. They actually got fairly close, close to Paris, but they were stopped right here. The first American forces were put into battle right here at Chateau Terre and fought fairly well. And now the German offensive right on scene, the reserves are done. And this actually is time Germany should have immediately sued for peace. <laughs> but no, they would not quit. And so Foch ordered an August offensive. And this was just to push the Germans back with this yellow area to the area um, where the line originally started in 1918. Yet the Germans' army began to break. Eventually, by November, they would push them all the way back to this green line right here. The German army began to collapse. The first big American offensive on their own was right here at Sammy Hill near Verdun. 
and my great great uh, uncle's married. Does he married? Yeah. Buried. That's a interesting slip. Yeah. So when my wife and I went to Verdun, we went and saw his grave, another partridge, and Verdun. I highly recommend it. It's really cool, beautiful area, and this incredible site. And it is the most hollow ground in France. And we had one of our best experience traveling there, not only because it was really interesting, but everybody was so nice and so happy you know, that we were there at this French site, because usually just French go and very few American tourists. And we stayed at this pension, which is kind of like a slightly upscale bed and breakfast, not upscale, bigger bed and breakfast. And it was really fun, really nice trip. And they kind of made a special meal for us. And it was just really great. And they were so nice. And so, so we're, everybody there, all the French we met around that area, just so friendly. And we did not find out until after we left that the owners didn't charge us for the two nights with the meal. They paid for us, yeah. And I know exactly what you're thinking. It's because my wife is obviously very cool. And yes, that's true. My wife charmed them. No, no, it's, it was really nice. They paid for it. The friends in front of the rear yeah. And that's why people say, um, they, they talk about like, different Arab countries and they're not nice. I say, you don't know what you're talking about. There are nice people and jerks everywhere. There are jerks out here, not here. Let me tell you one more story really quick. That's happened to us twice on trips. It happened once in Britain too, where people paid for us. The French are trying to, no, we're just as cool as the French. Okay, so the area where the most American soldiers would fight and the largest casualties would be in this area right here called the Argonne Forest. Heavily, heavily fighting. These are exhausted Americans. These, This is a night attack by American soldiers. Look at the remnants of the forest. That was That's a heavily forested area. And it was just devastated by shots. The Argonne was a nightmarish area fighting almost 80,000 US casualties in that one small area. Just a bloodbath. But the German army was collapsing. It was falling apart. For the first time in the war, large numbers of German forces surrendered at the end of September, and it would just get worse. These are all prisoners that the British took in one day the end of September, called the Black Day of the German Army. And it just was falling apart. And in October, Austria, Bulgaria, and the Ottoman Empire all collapsed. Just boom, all collapsed and super peace, just all at once. And they broke apart into civil war, and Germany was nearing the end. And then, revolution in Germany. It started at the naval yard, the sailors, Tired of being cooped up or their, their ships and also ordered to go. They thought a suicidal attack against the English it wasn't quite that, but that's what they thought. They mutinied on board the ships and then spread throughout Germany. The Kaiser asked the army to put down the rebellion and they, and they were told the army won't do it. The army's done. And the Kaiser abdicated. He ran away to the Netherlands where he would die in 1942 in the middle of World War II. And Germany just fell apart. A new government was created, and they immediately asked for a ceasefire. Foch wanted to finish the German army off. He, fed, he, he thought we had to advance in Germany and totally destroy it. So they would never do it again. But the allure of finally ending this thing happened. And so an armistice was signed, which is a ceasefire. So the United States, Britain, France, Belgium, you know, the Allied powers, this was the line when the war ended. They never invaded, got into Germany. It was here. But the armistice was, in essence, a peace agreement. I'm sorry, a, a surrender. And they could have ended it the night before, but someone on Foch's staff said, would be cool if the war to end all wars ended on the 11th hour. The 11th day of the 11th. Yeah, day. So they fought another half a day. General William Bullock, who was in command of the U.S. First Army, he was furious that he didn't get another chance to attack. And so he ordered the last U.S. offensive of the war at 10 a.m. on November 11th. 
In fact, Germans were yelling at them before they fired the machine guns, don't go, the war is over. And they still went over the top and over a thousand casualties. And um, there's a myth that Germany ordered this. No, it was the United States that did that. And the war ended. Actually, everyone fired everything they had in the last five minutes before 11. They just fired everything up in the air. And then silence. And both sides just kind of got out of the trenches and stared at each other. I guess it was just, just what did we just done? The German army marched home and then was immediately disbanded. That was kind of the deal the generals made with them. If you agree to march home, we'll let you go. Don't mute me. It's kind of a deal. And they marched home. And now a peace agreement needs to be made. But the surrender would be made, a ceasefire at a rail, in a rail carriage. Here it is. This is the beginnings of a French monument that would make it Compiègne Forest. So in this forest, these are the Allied negotiators, and they basically dictated the terms to the Germans, the brand new German provisional government. And the, the French are going to make this into a massive monument. You can imagine. A huge monument after the war. And this will be a site then of major German humiliation. Here's a picture of that same rail car just a few years later. Do you see it? So when France shockingly fell to the Germans in a month and a half, it still just should not never have happened, but it blew everyone's mind it did. Hitler ordered the surrender of the French in the same rail car. And they took the rail car back to Berlin and they blew up the French monument with dynamite and stuff in the dust. An Allied bombing in March of 1945, the US and British bombing of Berlin during the war, in, in the damage they destroyed that car, so it's gone. We'll get back to World War II. Over nine millions died, but we don't know, it could be significantly more. There's so many people died in the Russian front. We don't know exactly how many in the Ottoman Empire. And how do you count the Russian Civil War? These are US soldiers hastily burying men at the Argonne and they would reinter them after the war. There's a huge American cemetery. And it's really interesting that the cemetery, so there, there's American cemeteries in World War I and World War II in France. And they're like little tiny pieces of America right there. The Americans can keep it, and then right outside of, same with the British ones, and right outside the French one. But it's France. The German cemeteries, the French, meticulously keep it, but the French keep it. And the numbers of Americans who died is kind of shocking, considering the bulk of American forces were fired in August and November. 126,000. And you can imagine that all these people from 18 to 30 years old are gone now. And those who survived, are never the same. They've gone through something that we can't comprehend. This generation will be called the lost generation. I'll come back to that picture, the lost generation. And here are Germans, and you can see all the amputees. That became one of the symbols after the war. It's been kind of, it's basic, it's always been this way, and it's one of the tragedies of war. After the war is over, everyone tries to forget the veterans, and so they don't care about that's why um, part of the New Deal during World War II, what's called the GI Bill, was like college aid and also aid in housing for veterans out of the war. That was so revolutionary um, that Democrats passed over really big Republican opposition in the 1940s. But back to this. These are the number of people died in the 1920s. And this is one battalion of just under 500 men standing at attention in row after row in front of Edinburgh Castle in Scotland. That's 1915 before they went to the front. That's all that came back in the state. That's in 1919. And now we have a peace treaty, the Treaty of Versailles. There's actually four treaties we lump together as one Treaty of Versailles. And we're gonna go through the base, we gotta go through a couple things really quick. And the big thing is, There was talk of all the allies coming together, but it would soon devolve to the leaders of the three main allies, the big group. The French, George Clemenceau, 
And there's George Clemenceau right there in its 70s. He was an old, they, they call him the old lion. He had been in the French parliament forever as a socialist, but turned into a hardened um, wartime leader. And their goal, the end didn't come in, but never again. Germany has to be put in a situation where they can never build, build up their army. They can never build up, have uh, build up their economy to attack again. The British, David Lord George, right here, he, he took over as prime minister during the middle of the war, and their goal, try to hold on to the empire. Britain was broke after the war, and the only way they could see out their way to build back their gold reserves was to squeeze money out of their four colonies. So remember the 14 points implied self-determination? Nah, not Britain. And then Wilson. Wilson talked a good show about the 14 points, but even he acknowledged that the 14 points was unrealistic by the summer of 1918. In fact, Clemenceau's famous statement about it was, Wilson has his 14 points. God only had 10. Meaning the allies basically thought this was unworkable and no way they're going to allow for self-determination or get whatever they want. And here is the biggie. What did GOP, what parties the GOP? Those are Republicans, the grand old party, the Republicans. I like how they started calling the map of the 1880s and they weren't, uh, <laughs> the party was um, not as old as the Democrats. I'm just used to it, so I just said. Henry Cabot Lodge was the, the Senate, foreign, foreign Rela Senate Foreign Relations Committee head. So he was head of the Foreign Relations Committee. He was a Republican senator, Henry Cabot Lodge. And Republicans had control of the Senate. They need two thirds of the Senate. And Wilson did not invite Lodge. Lodge was furious. He already hated Wilson. And now he despised Wilson. And Lodge kind of wanted a treaty. But he wasn't even part of it. So when they got back, when Wilson got back with his treaty, Lodge was already mad. This would have such a crucial bearing for the next 20 years of American foreign policy and be a crucial element to include in any essay about the ratification battle for the Treaty of Versailles. You've all caught my hand, right? Henry Cabot Lodge. He's also in the reading you had, too, so that we should be doubly reinforced on this. Italy? Italy thought they'd be treated as an equal, and their premier, uh, Orlando, was sent. I mean, he was so mad at being ignored, he went back to Italy for a while, realized no one cared then. Italy did not get near what they thought they were going to get, and this would fester in Italy, considering the fact they did so poorly in the war. Japan, who thought they were going to be on the, going to be on the victorious side, they felt snubbed. I'm sure that will have no impact down the road towards Japanese politics. Nobody from Russia was even invited. They're in that civil war. They didn't invite the new Bolshevik government. They didn't invite representatives from the white. They were totally ignored. That too will fester inside the new Soviet Union. So that's a painting of the Allied representatives in the House of the, the Hall of Mirrors in Versailles, where they signed the Treaty with Germany. Wilson. Clemenceau, Lord George. If you get a chance to go to France, go to Versailles. It's really kind of amazing. So, Germany. Last, last couple of things. The Allies kept the blockade going the whole time of the treaty. When the representatives of the brand new German government arrived there, they sincerely thought they'd be treated as equals. And they tried to say, we're members of the Socialist Party. We were opposed to the war, and the Allies didn't care. They locked him in a hotel room, literally, and said, we're going to give you a document to sign, and you'll sign it, or we keep that starvation blockade going on. And they never forgot that. And therefore, they had to sign the war guilt cause, saying that they were fully responsible for the war. And if they're fully responsible, then they can be punished in the treaty. And if they're fully responsible, 
That means they could have all their colonies take away. They lost their colonies. They lost territory. All this area in black, they lost. Germany is going to be divided in two. And this area in black will be given to the new nation of Poland, even though the majority population here are ethnically, were ethnically Germans. Not now, but they were then. And they lost their military. They kept, they called it a rump army. You don't need the numbers. You just have to know they lost the military. But I just want to give you an example. Tiny army, no air force, no subs, no capital ships, those are the dreadnoughts, no tanks. That's part of the reason why in Germany, these paramilitary groups became really important, like the Free Corps, or this one political party would create the sports battalion that were their paramilitary. They decided sports battalion would not be good for the Nazi paramilitary, so they started calling them stormtroopers. Sports battalion would have been better. And lastly, they had to pay reparations of $33 billion. Originally, it was going to be as high as $55 million. And some of it would be payment as in, like, they had to give 200 milk cows to Belgium. Or 100 camels to the new, new country called Saudi Arabia. The thought was, if they pay this, it'll pay for the damages, but also, it'll be such a drain on their economy, Germany will no longer be able to build what? And on. Do you think Germany will, this will be uh, accepted in Germany? Oh, they're going to love it. Love it. All right, goodbye, everybody. So I made a couple changes on the uh, a couple things on the DBQ a little bit different. So please read through this. Oh, and the DBQ was going to be tomorrow, but I just found out literally last night. I might I might be gone. So I want to be here when people take that. So it's going to have to be on. Sound good? Very cool. <laughs> and have to change your dress. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
Um, oh, we didn't do it. We just, I just decided. To but you got all the notes. I know you'll get everything too. And the film, the, all the video work. Was it exciting? I know. I didn't get a chance to change your grade on, but I will. But you know what? I, and I. I don't know how you know. But also, I have 16. I have 24. My nine doesn't look like a four. But I'll share it. Don't worry. I'll have to change things around because I just, I literally just got out last time. Yeah, and so if I'm going to be gone, I wanted to be here when we do the game. So, so I'll hold on to that. Yeah, I always say. Uh, like yeah, I'm, and I might be here. If I remember, we just have a regular day of class. I'll just not worry about it. Whatever. And if I'm going to be gone, yeah, if I'm gone tomorrow, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, everybody. I have a gift. All right, everyone, look at the two sides. Everyone, turn on the side of the side right here. A little faded, but it works. Just give me one sec. I have to. Uh, I have to stop the film. I got he had a couple of daughters, but the throne went to the seat. But Archduke. <laughs> But Franz Ferdinand did die from 1916. I don't think you have the 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 can I get a bath? Wait, what was the... Oh, I get... Uh, <laughs> Do it later. All right, so, a couple things in really quick. <coughs> All right, so, tomorrow, I might be gone. And if... if so, we're going to have a test that day, just, just because of that. Is everybody... Huh? No, tomorrow I might be gone, and so I want to... I'm going to be here when you do, do your DBQ, and so, so we'll have to do it on Wednesday. Next. Hey. No. And I got something in my eyes, and my eyes red, so I'm also here. Did anyone gone yet? When anyone got on Friday when I had this out, the, the sample DBQ? On Fridays, I'm here hit. All that is is just a sample. That's a good <coughs> an average of all right, so I was talking to somebody, I think I might have mentioned this on on Friday, but talking to someone in the college board, talking about what they're going to emphasize on the new college, on the new DBQ, because they changed it in at the end of September. People didn't know until October. And so I made a few changes on mine, but uh, I'm glad I talked to them because it gave me a little hint about what they were going to look for. And since I saw you're taking the, the AP exam, I thought it'd be good to, to help set up that position. And I think some of the changes, I think some of the changes are good. Some of them are, you know, that's but it's the world we have it. So let's talk about it really quick. So I wrote this up right here. I wrote this up of everything we need to know, and I use some of their terminology. And so the first one is, I put the, you know, these five basic things you got to get to get all the points. And the thesis statement. So 
they're calling the why and the subtopics, they're starting to call them claims. So that is your claim or your position, but your claim on how you're gonna answer. I claim this about the farm. That is my claim. And then the rest of your essay has to support your claims. And I thought that's not a bad way to look at it. I claim that you know, these are the reasons why the treaty was not ratified. These are the reasons why there is secession. These are the reasons we dropped the atomic bomb. That is my claim and I'm gonna support it. So I didn't think that was bad. Next, context. So it's always you have to have, when they change the context, you need that some kind of background, big picture material outside the narrow realms of the prompt. And they're looking for a little bit more. So they want that big picture, that background material, the things that led up to the events with the theme and the prompt, they want that and they want the effect, what came after the big picture. And so let's say we're doing the events that, uh, that led to secession. That's when you would have in context in that first paragraph, have issues about like the events that led up to, this, to the Civil War, actually before secession, the things that aren't in your body paragraphs. So you have things like the Industrial Revolution, Manifest Destiny, a Mexican War, maybe Compromise of 1850, you know, some of those events. And then in the closing paragraph, so, you know, on the very bottom, I have closing. That's what they want broad context about big picture of the effects. So what came out of secession? A horrible civil war that the South almost won. But the North did win with an Emancipation Proclamation in the 13th Amendment and Reconstruction, which radically changed the country forever. And, and three major amendments, 13, 14, and 15. <coughs> but an unfinished promise for equal rights. Something like that in a few sentences. They won't catch what I'm saying. So if we're doing one on, let's say, the ratification battle of the Treaty of Versailles, you have some stuff about, you know, very brief about the war and the treaty and, and the treaty itself, and the conclusion about how isolationism in the United States ended the war and would not solve the problems that would lead to World War II. Get that point there. So this is what they want on all essays, that context front and back. So you need them both. One for sure, but they're saying we're looking for two, even though they only say one in their thing. I know. That's the world we inhabit, so we'll do it. Okay. So you'll notice in the old oh, and then evidence and documents. So they want you to, to be able to explain four documents, and show how you support your thesis. And then extended analysis. That's what happens. You have to do that for two to get a point and four to get an additional point. They call that extended analysis. You're basically explaining they believe this because of some historical event going on. Their point of view. They believe this, like Wilson wanted the Treaty of Versailles because he was a liberal internationalist, something like that. Or who they're trying to convince, their audience. And then, and so that's what they want for some analysis. And then, what, for over 20, 25 years that I've been doing this, they've called outside information, they've now changed outside information too, Evidence beyond docs, EVDs. The guy kept saying EVDs, and I finally just, what are you talking about? Well, that's the outside information. Okay, so they changed it to, they like acronyms. So one additional piece of information per body paragraph outside the documents. It's pretty mechanical then. What that means is for your body paragraphs, everyone look at the body paragraphs. I have your topic, that's from your <coughs> thesis, quick topic sentence, quick explanation of what it is, kind of, you know, and then evidence one, that's the document, your first document. <coughs> evidence two would be outside information, evidence three, another document. Did everyone catch how I did that? So for document one, and then, oh, almost forgot. 
So I started jumping the gun. So they changed it totally this year. And they said two things. To get that last point of full credit, you must have these four documents. And then for each of these four, use half. That extended analysis. They believe this because of. Or use seven documents and show all seven documents for the thesis. It's either four each with half or seven. And I can see advantages to both. But he made it pretty clear they want that extended analysis. So to get full credit, you need to explain what the document is and how it supports your thesis and then have for your first call. Then outside information, use your second document and have. Did everyone catch now what I'm saying? So look at that first paragraph. It doesn't necessarily be, have to be in this order, but first document, outside information, second document, if you want to hedge your bet and use an additional document to make sure you get them all in, you can use it. Yeah. So you don't need outside information for the second document. No, you, you need outside. <laughs> one, you need one example of outside information per paragraph. Not per document. Not per document. And I just stuck it where he said it. But well, you could have that at the end of the paragraph. You can have that before the documents. You just need one outside information per paragraph. I'm sorry. Just one per paragraph. And so this is what we're going to do on the DBQ. When we do it, you're gonna it's gonna be a four paragraph essay. So you don't need A, B, and C for your thesis. You just need let's go C and A. All right. We just need two A and B for your thesis, right? For your subtopics. And then you're gonna write that first body paragraph, and you're gonna have topic sentence, a brief explanation, use two documents, and one example of outside information. You get what I said? Both body paragraphs would be like that. We use four documents. Sound good? Sound fun? Lastly, and this is another thing he emphasized. Don't forget, remember I, when I do short IDs, you know, I try to do everything kind of like short ID. Now this one has three examples of evidence, but still the basic format, the importance, you know, why it's important. They call that complex understanding. So, complex understanding, one last sentence showing how you have supported your thesis statement in that paragraph. One last sentence at the end of the, end of the paragraph. So, each document will have, you know, probably two to three sentences. Sentence for the outside information, another two to three sentences, last sentence of support, boom, another paragraph. So, four paragraph essays. Then we got what we're doing then. Then we got that. So if you turn, oh, last thing. Normally I always do a five paragraph essay and they said, you know, if you can get it in four paragraphs, that'd be fine. But they also suggested an optional paragraph where you use one more paragraph of just your information or a couple examples of your outside information and one additional document. Why would you use one additional document? In case you don't get full credit for one of your other ones, hedging your bet. Now, if you're running out of time, no. But if you have time, that's just an option. We're not gonna do that in class, but that's something to talk about with the other ones. Not very long. So I made this a lot long. And I did columns instead of this, so you could, I just kind of want to put them side by side, give you an idea. But, on that thesis, that's the basic outline. So I use columns just just to show and show space in there. I will let you have this when you do your DVD. And so please read through this. If there's any questions, please ask tomorrow if I'm here. Or ask on Teams. How about that? And I'll let you have this and I'll have and if I'm not here, I'll have the South Panel accounts. You'll get the documents in advance. 
this is a little mechanical, and I don't like that. You're know, like, okay, you have this sentence, this sentence, this sentence. You know, it's not like writing a free flowing essay. But at the same time, it's a timed essay. So you got to get. You don't have much time to plan. So this, in a way, is good. So this is what I want you to do. I do want you to make your outline in class before you start. I hope you have a plan before you write it. I just want you to get used to the timing of having to do that and write the essay. But you, huh? Yeah, already filled out. But if you, but you, you're gonna have the documents already. You can write and mark those up. So you can have kind of hints of your outline is gonna be. I just want you to go through the process of writing for the time. That's all. Carter, your name. Oh yeah, I was gonna ask. And so that's all. But, but you'll probably have a pretty good idea. That's purely for time. Just you have to go through the process real quick. Yeah, I, I look at this like, oh, God, it's so mechanical. But then again, time to essay, mechanical is not necessarily enough. That's what you got. All right? So please read through this. If there's any glaring typos, let me know, because I was typing off my notes and trying to get it done very quickly. I, it was proofread once, very ably, but I just want to make sure again. All right. Let's go ahead and put this away and take out your notes. Oh, that means on Wednesday, chapter 23 in the review book was going to be due on Wednesday. Remember that? I was going to do a quiz on that day. So what should we do with that? Do it on Thursday. Yeah. I'll bump it one day. Whatever. It's no big deal. Oh, there's one tomorrow. Who wants it tomorrow? No, it'll be Thursday. Thursday, I promise. How many documents are on the Like Seven. Oh, so that's seven. Seven is on Huh? Yeah, seven, you have to use every one. My problem with that is there's always one or two documents and it's like, what the heck are they talking about? Or you pick four you know, that seems better. And they made it sound like they kind of want that. Yeah. But how, how long is the paragraph then? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight to nine sentences. That's not too long. Each paragraph. It's not too bad. I know it's always easy for me to say. So it's like a. It, it is still the same basic format as a short ID, but instead of one example, you need basically. Whatever. You'll get documents. Documents will help you out. All right. So do we get? Where do we finish here? Do we finish prohibition? No. Do we get bolstered act? Do we get to? I don't know if we. Okay. Bolstered act was the enforcement of prohibition. And it basically put a big tax on it. Put a big tax. Was I filming this whole time? Do we have it? Can I it on? Uh, we filmed all of that. 